Today, we're going we're gonna to destroy fear. Amen? Amen. You're going to leave here today with no concern about fears. Father, we thank you today for your presence. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you said where two or three are gathered together in your name, there will you be in the midst of them. We welcome your Holy Spirit. Move up and down every aisle. I thank you, Lord, that you said in your word that you sent your word and it healed them. So, Lord, I thank you that as the word goes forth, healing will take place. I curse sickness and disease right now. No one under the sound of my voice will sit here in discomfort or pain. I thank you, Father, that as I decrease, you'll increase. I pray less of me and more of you, none of me and all of you. Think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords. Father, those things that you would have me to say to these, your sheep. And it's in the mighty, all-knowing, all-powerful name of Jesus, the anointed one, and the power of that anointing that we pray. And let all that agree, shout amen. Amen. Give that good-looking person next to you a big old hug. Tell them you're glad to see them. There's another good-looking person on the other side. Hallelujah. Open your Bibles. Open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I got, I got some news for you. There's something else going to change. Something going to happen at Revealing Truth Ministries you thought would probably never, ever happen, ever. It's going to happen this year. Want to know what that is? You might see me teaching with an iPad mini. <laughs> I got me an iPad mini from, for, for Christmas, and I've been studying on it, man, and looking at it. And, and I discovered one clear, everybody say clear. clear, an obvious advantage. You know, the print in this Bible, this is as big as the print can get. Yep. <laughs> in the type of Bible I like to use, the parallel with the yep. Amplified and King James on the other side. With my iPad Mini, if the reading get hard to see, I could just stretch it. <laughs> Johnny, I'm in trouble. Because, you know, I, I got to repent, man. I done laughed at folk with their iPads. And, what are you going to do when your batteries run out? You know, you know. So, pray the Lord. Change is inevitable Amen. for all of us. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, are you ready? Okay, we're going to destroy fear. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to absolutely kick fear in the butt today. Amen. No more fear. <laughs> I ain't talking about no t-shirt or sign either. We're going to show you what fear really is, how it, where it comes from, and why you shouldn't have anything to do with it. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Get ready for some change. Look what he says here. Verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. So God's not hiding truth from you. He's not, he doesn't have all these great promises that's going to cause great benefit to come to your life. And it's like an Easter egg hunt. God's not hiding the blessing from you. He's not hiding truth from you. He says it's not hidden. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. So the key here, he doesn't just want us to hear the word, but he wants us to hear and do the word. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. There's not a great evangelist that's going to be able to go get it for you. You got to get it for yourself. Look at your neighbors. You got to get the word for yourself. Your, your favorite pastor can't get it for you. Your, your favorite Teacher can't get it for you. Your favorite televangelist can't get it for you. You got to get it for yourself. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. One of the problems in the body of Christ with people being so fearful and so, so inundated with this 
idea of failure, you've seen your leaders fail. Talk to me. So if your faith was in the leader and not in the word, when the leader fell, there's no hope for you. Because you knew they were better off than you. Otherwise, you would, instead of you listening to them, you, they'd have been listening to you. I mean, that's just kind of a general concept. When you go in a classroom, you pay the school, you pay the, the university, the college, because of an expectation that the professor know more than you. Otherwise, you show up at the school and tell them to pay you. Amen. Right? Amen. Are you listening to me? Yes. So he said, neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go up over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. He said to verse 14, but the word is very near unto thee. In thy mouth. Where's the word? In, the in thy mouth. What's in your mouth? What should be in your mouth? The word in your mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Then he says in verse 15, see, look, this is, this is what's in front of every born again believer, every non-believer, but I'm talking to believers today. Every day. Look at your neighbor say, every day this is, this is there. Every day. Not just Sunday and Wednesday. Not just church days, but every day this is before you. He says, see, I've set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. Both of them are there. Life and good, death and evil. What's before you every day? Choices. <laughs> decisions. Every day we're faced with decisions. All day, every day, I should say, right? Wouldn't it be great? If, 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 if the only opportunity for decisions were made between 7 and 8 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> then all you had to do was prepare to hear and respond properly for one hour? No, it's just not life, is it? All day, every day, you got to not only hear, but respond correctly. You know, choices are, are before you all day, every day. He says, <clears throat> In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments. Why? That thou mayest live and multiply. Now, everybody want to live. And multiply. That's a good thing. He says, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, turn away from what? Living and multiplying. Something had to turn, you know, everybody want to live. So if you get to a point where you don't want to live, something turned you. Something turned your heart away from Living, even desiring to live. That's where suicidal thoughts come from. That's where failure comes from. That's where, that's where despair and depression comes from. The root of all of those, those emotions is fear. I can't take it no more. Where'd that come from? Nobody wakes up that, that, that wants to live and multiply, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, I don't want to live. You just woke up. What happened between wake up and get up that got you depressed? Okay. It can't be something that happened to you that day. The day just getting started. Right. Let me tell you what it is. I'm going to fast forward. It's fear. And fear is, is a subject. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a spirit. Mm -hmm. To be more specific, fear is the manifestation of the desires of a demonic spirit. There's a spirit of fear. It says that in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. That God has not given us the spirit of fear. Spirit, fear is not an idea. It's not, a, it's not a concept. Fear is a spirit. So let me tell you what happens. This is why people wake up depressed. While you were sleeping, the demon was planning. And that spirit showed up 
and made an offering. Mm. We call them thoughts. The problem is not what the demon is thinking. It's only a problem for you when you say or repeat what he's thinking. What do you mean, Pastor? You know, the Bible says, Jesus said, all power is given unto me of my Father which is in heaven. How many of you know all is all? So if I got all, you ain't got none. Unless you steal some of mine or I give it to you. So where does the devil get his power? From your words. The power of life and death is where? In the tongue. That's why God said he put his word in your mouth. He put the power to produce life in your mouth. Are you listening to me? So there's an enemy to us enjoying and having life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, he said, the thief only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they, said, that's me, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So not just life, but abundant life. All right, watch this now. He says, see, verse 15, see, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. So every day, both of them right there. <coughs> Checking you out, waiting to see what words you're going to speak to turn one law on or tell them, turn another law off. You got it? The Bible talks about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death in Romans chapter 8. So every word you and I speak, turning one law on or another law off. We're given access. You know, it's like standing at the, standing at an at a, uh, ATM. You put in the right code, you gain what? Access to your money. If you don't have an account in the bank, you can stand there and punch numbers till they arrest you. <laughs> you ain't gonna stand there for too long. But they got cameras watching you. But after a while, you just keep punching numbers. They know you're trying to take something you don't have a right to access. They call you a thief. Some people wonder why their lives are you know, jacked up. Well, let me tell you, you turn the law on. Right. Which law? The law of sin and death. Right. You say things that you say, watch this now, you say things, you say, you say things that you then say you didn't mean to say. Right. Look, your neighbor said, that sounds like schizophrenia. Yes. <laughs> Let's use a biblical word, double-mindedness. And the Bible says in the book of James chapter 1, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think he shall receive anything that he asks for from the Lord. So being double-minded, saying things you really don't want to see, puts you on the opposite side of the blessing. So now because of your words, God not working for you, he's actually watching you work for yourself, which is working against him. He's not working against you. You're working against yourself. That's like me saying, I want to go down the aisle. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Guess what I'm not doing? I'm not making no progress. Look at neighbor and say, well, how do you feel? Like you're making progress or standing still? I, I think it's sad when you put forth effort that's designed for movement, but you don't get nowhere. Mm -hmm. What are you saying, Pastor? You know, your words create opportunities or they kill opportunities. Life and death is in the power of the what? Uh -huh. An opportunity without power would never come to fruition. Say that. An opportunity, opportunity. without power, power. would never come to fruition. It's like a, gar, like a car without fuel. Put water in your tank. The needle will stay full. But it's the wrong kind of power. It's not going anywhere. Are you listening to me? 
What are you saying, Pastor? You could say a lot of things and think you, you could talk a lot and be saying nothing. You ain't going nowhere. You know some people like that? They just did a cha-cha in the same position for the last 20 years. Listen to me. Look what he says here. <coughs> I love verse 17. Or verse 16. I like it all. <laughs> he said in that. I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Why? That thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land <coughs> whether thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou will not hear. Notice, heart turn, ears get stopped up. Heart turn, ears get stopped up. Heart turn, you can't hear. You can still talk, but you can't hear. That's sad. Your heart turn, you can still talk, but you can't hear. You know what that means? Your heart's now turned away from God because you you're, 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 you've been influenced by the wrong thing, and if you keep talking, you can only go in the wrong direction. Because now that your heart is turned, you're going to start talking about how bad things are, how it ain't your fault, how this. You're still talking, but you can't hear nothing. You can't hear how wrong you are. You can't hear how you missed it. You can't hear how you need to correct it. You can't hear anything. That's because you offended. When your heart turns, where is it turning? It's turning away from God. Your heart turns, you can't hear. All right, let me show you this in a relationship. You ever been in a relationship where somebody hurt you, offended you? You don't want to hear nothing they got to say. They say, I'm sorry. You don't want to hear that. They say, I apologize. You don't want to hear that. Why? Because you hurt. Because your heart is turned. You were loving them. Now you want to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> right? When your heart turns, you can't hear. That's what happened to people in church. When their heart turned, they don't long love the pastor. They don't trust the pastor. They move from the front row to the middle row to the back row out the door. <laughs> Same thing happens in the home. First thing that leaves a relationship is the desire to communicate and to give. Right? Mm hmm Look what he says. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou will not hear. Not that you lost hearing, you don't want to hear. Okay? You're not, you're not, uh, what do they call it, deaf? You're not deaf. It's not a medical problem, not a physical problem. You, you know, you don't want to hear. You don't want to hear because your heart turned. You can hear, you don't want to hear. He says, and find a place, the writing is little. <laughs> yeah, th these glasses are weird too. You know these glasses, when they, when they, when the eye lady do, do the, you know, we go to the dog lady to do our eyes. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> the, the, the optometrist has dogs. I call her the dog lady. Hope she ain't listening to me because she might not like the fact I call her the dog lady. But I don't really care because she got them dogs. That would make her the dog lady. <laughs> she don't want to be called the dog lady. Get, get birds or something. All right, listen to this. All right, don't remember what, verse 17. <laughs> but if thine heart turn away, so that thou will not hear, but shall be drawn, look at this, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. You know, when Satan starts to, 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 when he introduces fear to turn you, turn you from what? From faith, from God. 
That's the whole idea. If you're on the right track and he want to turn you, he has to introduce some type of fear. Fear of failure. Fear of success. Fear of rejection. I mean, there's a whole list of them. But there's one root to all the fear. Are you listening to me? <laughs> he said, I denounce unto you this day that you will surely perish and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land whether thou, goeth, uh, whether thou pass it over Jordan to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Notice all of it's there. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Now, that's what we want to talk about. What, what is influencing your chooser? What is influencing your decisions? Because that's really what our life is about. It's a series of choices. Every day we're making decisions. <clears throat> so, faith is a life choice. We choose how we're going to live once we get born again. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Faith is corresponding action in obedience to God's command, his word. Amen? It's not just knowing the word. Faith is you making a decision to make sure your actions line up with what you say you believe. To believe something that you refuse to do is evidence that you don't really believe it. To say you believe the word of God is the word of God. God talking to you, but you won't do it, says you don't really believe it. That action is faithless. Act of faith would say, I'm doing it because I believe it. So faith is a life choice. <clears throat> and when you don't choose faith, you are choosing fear by default. By default. I want to make that real clear. You, you, you can't be on the fence on this. When you don't choose faith, you choose fear by default. Here's, here's where that plays out in real life. Some of your life. <clears throat> well, I don't know what to do. So I'm just not going to do anything. <clears throat> what causes you to think like that? What causes you to come to the conclusion that doing nothing is a good choice? <laughs> it's like a, 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 it's kind of a joke. You know, there's these two guys in the woods. And, and this bear comes chasing after these guys. And this, this one guy's running, the other guy's running with him. And the guy's like, I, you, you think you can outrun the bear? He said, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> <laughs> so he's already made a choice. <laughs> My victory is, is outrunning you. I'm not thinking about the bear. He going to get one meal at a time. I want you to be the first one. <laughs> so if need be, I'm going to trip you up. He made a decision. <clears throat> so faith is a life choice. Say that. Faith is a life choice. And when you don't choose faith, you are choosing fear by default. And it will begin to operate in your life. Now, how do we make decisions? There's four things I want you to write down, four things I want you to think about that influences or controls how we decide to decide. You do know that's how it goes, right? You don't just decide. You decide to decide. So there's influences to the process of making a decision. Everybody does it. Nobody just go do. No, you decide to do. Then you do, right? Nobody's in here as a robot. You, you have, thank God you have say so 
and influence over your actions. Your body just don't just start doing stuff. Even if you like it and want to do it, it don't just say, you got to decide to decide. Isn't that correct? So here's four things that influences how we choose and why we choose. A decision is confirmed by what you allow. Write that down. A decision is confirmed by what you allow. Now, a lot of people want to blame other people, want to blame the government, want to blame this, that, the other for certain situations in their life. But the truth of the matter is, decisions are determined by what you allow. And here's four of the main influences that help determine or direct what we allow. Number one, what you allow to pass before your eyes. What you see. What you look at, how you look at things. You know, what you're looking at is going to determine how you decide things. So what's, let's say you're looking at the wrong thing. Now what you see is affecting what you do, not correctly, but incorrectly, because you're looking at it wrong. Number two. What you let go through your ears, what you hear, is going to influence what you decide. If you hear negativity all day, you allow that negativity to be, you allow your spirit to be subject or your soul to be subject to negative thoughts, negative influences. It will influence what you decide. They ain't no good. How you know they ain't no good? Well, I just feel like it ain't no good. <laughs> you, ever had, you ever had a situation on a new job or, or even on a current job when there's a new employee or when you're the new employee and somebody comes to you and they say something to you negative about somebody you don't even know? Now, you've got to learn how to, how to properly categorize what they said or it will influence your decisions. It's inevitable. You can't escape it. I mean, it, it could be something that you think is pretty innocent. You know, they come on, you know, you got to really watch them. What do you mean watch them? Watch them do what? Watch them why? What? I don't know. I just don't feel good about them. They, they ain't said nothing. They ain't told you nothing. They ain't said nothing. But yet now, you start formulating decisions about their character based on nothing. Right. Are you with me here? Yes. So you, you gotta, so you, you gotta watch out for those things that you allow. Allow what you hear. What, what am I listening to? You know, if you listen to the, to the wives of, of LA or the basketball wives or, you know, any of that nonsense. And, and, then, and then you're trying to make a decision about your relationship and your eyes and your ears have been influenced by that, then that's what's going to influence your decision. I mean, you know, sometimes you can see negative things and say, well, I'm definitely not going to do that. And I'm, I'm definitely not going to act like that. Well, you keep watching negativity. It's impossible for you not to do that. The third thing is, what you speak out of your mouth, what you allow to come out of your mouth is going to influence your decisions. Well, I don't know if we're going to make it. You probably won't. Well, I tell you what, this has been a tough year. Uh, next year going to be harder. It will for you. <laughs> you just said it. You just empowered it to be so. You did. Not the devil. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil ain't got that kind of power, baby. <laughs> We'd all be in trouble if he had the power most people think he has. It's what you say. You know, one of the things in raising our children, one of the things of phrases that, that I did not allow them 
to respond to me with when I question them about something is, I don't know. You're educated. We put you. To, we, we sent you to school. We made sure you went to school. You know how to read. You know how to write. Don't, I don't know is not acceptable. You know something. Now, whether you want to tell me or not, just tell me you don't want to tell me what you know, but don't tell me you don't know. I ain't no fool. You know something. And then little Greg, you know, he thought he knew something about everything. Matter of fact, he said that one day. He said, you know, I know a little bit about everything. <laughs> he was about 12 years old. We were on the interstate. And there was a wreck that had happened up in front of us. And I mean, just as confident as, a, as anybody could be, he, you know, he said, I wonder, you know, Deborah and I talked, wonder what happened. Greg said, I know what happened. <laughs> His mom asked him, how you know what happened? You don't know, you just think you know. He says, I know a little bit about everything. <laughs> Didn't he? <laughs> so now here come baby Greg. <laughs> he fired. And Greg is seeing the fruit of his own life. <laughs> it is so funny. We laugh at him all the time. Mm -hmm. How you like it now? Mr. Know a little bit about everything. <laughs> we were, we were, this was when he was three. Baby Greg was three. The boy thought he could fly. <laughs> And the only way Greg could convince him that he couldn't fly, he said, well, you know, superheroes can only fly when their dad is given permission. <laughs> so he convinced him of that. That way, we were, we were at, remember we were at 4th of July? This boy was trying to jump off the top of a building. Because he thought he could fly. And I kept thinking, that's something to that. You know, children don't have fear. He really, he might can fly. <laughs> We ain't going to find, yeah, find out the night. <laughs> but he really believed he can. Oh, man, that's a whole other message. But they don't have, he didn't have any fear. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't have any fear. Fear, listen to me. Oh, here's the fourth one. What you, what you plant in your heart, what you allow to be planted in your heart, One scripture says the, your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Every time you speak, those words are writing on your heart. The Bible says out of, your, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, you know, when somebody say to you, you know, I hate you. Wish I'd never met you or married you. And then they see your reaction to those words and they don't like the reaction. I mean, they cut a little too deep and, and they say, I didn't mean that. No, they really did. They really did. Now, they, they may not have meant for it to hurt like it did, because they wanted to hurt you, but maybe not hurt you that bad. You ever wanted to hurt somebody, but not really hurt them to the point of no return? I mean, you just cut a little too deep that time. Oh, I'm the only one ever did something like that. I mean, you sitting up in here looking at me like y'all super saints. If you didn't do it, you thought it. They hurt you, you want to hurt them, and you know words can hurt. Yes. Correct? Yes. Well, you know how powerful words are. So you already have an experience with the truth of what I'm saying. Are you listening to me? See, some of you, worst, first, worst thing that happens, somebody can hurt you. They disappoint you and hurt you. You open up a food bank of poisonous words. You set them up to die off your words. You'll lead them to the slaughter with your words. You know, I really care about you. I really love you. Just to get them hooked and then say, you know, I was lying all along. Can't stand you. You remember when you cheated on me five years ago? Payback. <laughs> That's the way some people are. Some people have been hurting for 30 years before you met them. That's why you need to investigate before you. Mm -hmm. So people are making decisions. People make decisions. We make decisions. All of us make decisions. These are four things that influences, that we allow, that influences those decisions.
fear is a foreign spirit that we receive from the outside. Now this is very important. All fear originates outside of you. It is foreign to a born again believer's experience with Christ. It's not part of it. All fear comes from the outside. There is no fear that originates in a born again believer. Very important for you to understand this. So all fear, any type of fear, any way you want to shape the fear, any way the fear manifests itself does not originate from the inside of you, it originates from the outside. It's something over there, something that came from somewhere else to try and influence you on the inside. Now let me give you a scripture. Are you with me here? Okay, go to Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Are you with me here today? Yeah. I think this is a very important message to set you up for victory in 2014. Yeah. You ain't going to be afraid of nothing. Because you know the, re the source of all of that stuff. Look at this. Verse 14 and 15. Are you there? Yeah. Listen to what he says. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we're led by what? Spirit. All the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. Be spirit fed and what? Spirit led. So he says in verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Fear is always associated with bondage. Anytime fear is present, bondage is the outcome. Well, let me say it another way. Anytime fear is introduced, bondage is the outcome. In a relationship, when a person uses fear, bondage is the harvest. They're trying to control you. They're trying to manipulate you. If fear is present, Love is not. Come on, Pastor, elaborate on that. That's it. Well, here's what the Bible says. Perfect love cast out all fear. So if love is present, fear is gone. If fear is present, love is gone. me because he love you no there's some fear there was he mad yeah he was mad as a he was mad okay well anger is an emotion that's produced by fear I mean, think about it now every time you got really mad with somebody you were afraid of something I mean, they were going to hurt you, so you got to hurt them before they hurt you. They were going to hit you. They were going to shoot you. They were going to stab you. You got to react before they act. That's acting out of fear. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm, I'm going to quit this job before they fire me. Fear. Fear of being embarrassed in front of your coworkers. Fear of rejection. Well, I'm going to get out of this relationship before everybody realized I'm the one jacked it up. I'm going to leave them before they leave me. You know, all that fear. Right? So everybody understand. Perfect love casts out all fear. Now why is that? Because love seeks to give the advantage, not take advantage. Fear only wants to take advantage. Fear never, never, never ever considers the other individual. Fear only considers itself. A person influenced by fear, I should say, only considers themselves. Okay, now, if I do this and they do that, then I got to figure out what I'm going to do if I don't like that, that they did. And if you can work all that out, then you move forward. If you don't, then you hesitate. That's why some men don't you know, they, they like to hesitate when it comes to marriage. 
Well, there's a fear there. There's more fear than love. How you know that, Pastor? Perfect love, cast out. And what does love do? Love wants to. So if I'm seeking to give you the advantage, every advantage that's it's in my power to give you, that's an expression of my love and appreciation for you. There is no fear. Are you with me here? Perfect love casts out all fear. There's fear. <coughs> Anger is around the corner. Fear never satisfies. Fear only disappoints. Fear seeks to protect its own interests. Total opposite of love. Love seeks to give the advantage. Are you with me here? Yeah. So he says here, for you have not received a spirit of bondage again to fear. So fear has what? Bondage. People in bondage in their marriages, they're in bondage in their jobs, they're in bondage with their children. I mean, you know, I mean, it, think about this. If you can't speak freely, one of y'all in bondage or both of you in bondage. I can't tell them how I really feel about that because last time I tried to, they, they, they just fell apart. So now you have a fear that's become a component of how you interact with your husband or wife in your relationship. That's fear-based, not love-based. You know, Deborah and I, we may, not, we may disagree about things. We often disagree about stuff because we're two different people. However, we also agree that there's more fun when we agree than disagree. So we limit the, our exposure to disagreement. Because ain't nobody going nowhere. <laughs> so ain't no sense in you being upset and me being upset and you being uncomfortable and me being uncomfortable and I ain't having no fun and you ain't having no fun. This is not what I signed up for and ain't, we ain't going nowhere so let's fix it. Now this could be this could be a 30 second inconvenience or it could be the rest of our relationship if we don't deal with it. So if we gonna have to deal with it. Why would, why should we wait six hours? I mean we gonna have to fix it so let's fix it in the first 30 seconds. Are oh, you with me here? That's love seeking to give the advantage. Now that means sometimes you know even though she's wrong I have to make her think she's right. <laughs> Nah, I may be wrong. It doesn't matter who's wrong. Ain't nobody going nowhere. You're going to fix it. And when you're both together working on something, it's really not right or wrong. It's just my perspective, your perspective. Well, you know, I don't always have to have it my way. It's not bad. It's not what, Burger King? It's cool. I can, I can live with your way. It's, it ain't been that bad. Do it your way then. Let's just do it. Oh, you see what I'm saying? Especially when I know she loves me and she's just doing what she do to give me the advantage. I'm doing what I do to give her the advantage. She really believes that and I really believe that. Even if I don't get my way, I get my way. It's a win-win. Are you with me here? Or we can both lose. You know when you both lose, fear is involved. Try to take advantage of me. Take advantage of me. Here I am. Sign, seal, deliver. Take advantage of me. Let's see if you can take advantage of me. Do it. What you want to do? I'm, I'm game with Deborah. Now, somebody else? Now, that's a whole other story. I ain't, I ain't game. I ain't even participating. Are you listening to me? There's no fear involved in that. Are you with me here? That's freedom. All right. Somebody need to hear all of that. Look what he says. For you have not, you have not, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Now, isn't that the way we were before we got saved? Scared of stuff. 
I know as an alcoholic, I was always afraid of the police, man, you know, because I'm drunk all the time. So, you know, every time blue lights come on, man, I'm freaking. They could be going to something else. I'm scared. I'm, fear is there. Why? Well, my behavior, my actions produce that fear. My wrong actions. Right? Isn't that the same thing everywhere? Every time you do something wrong, fear is present. Unless you, you know, you, your conscience is so seared with sin, you no longer can recognize right or wrong. You know, that's what happened to people that have been hurt a lot. And so they built this wall of protection to the point where you're, you protecting yourself hurt others. They trying to love you, give you the advantage, but you won't talk, you won't say nothing. They see you hurting. You know, the worst thing you could do is say nothing's wrong when something's wrong. How can I help you if you keep saying nothing? Now you're lying to me. Because if this is what life is life with, like with you when nothing's wrong, I pray to God nothing ever gets wrong. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? All right. But you have received a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So, we, we're not, we're not, we don't, God hadn't given us a spirit of fear. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Hallelujah. Are you with me here? Yes. Can you use this? Yes. Today. Yes. All right. I love this. <clears throat> Verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. So fear is a what? It's a spirit. It's a spirit that influences decisions. It's a spirit that influences decisions. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of, he did give us this spirit, spirit of power, love, and what? Sound. Now listen to this in the Amplified. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Timidity. Of cowardice. You know what that means? There are some people that don't like confrontation. So you're being hurt by your husband, your wife, your children, and you don't want to say nothing because you don't want any confrontation. That's not love. That's fear. Can we all just get along? No, not till we all get it right. No, we can't just get along. Are you listening to what I'm saying? No, no, no. What you do, the way you do that thing there, that thing right there, that, that that thing right there, I don't like it. Now maybe I don't like it because I don't understand why you do it. Maybe you're trying to do something to help me, but you don't know it ain't helping me. Let's talk. How come we can't do that? Let me tell you why we can't do that. Fear. Well, if I tell them how I really feel about that, then they're going to reject me. So I ain't going to tell them. I'm going to just pretend like I like the way they treat me even though I don't. Are you getting this? Yes. That's fear-based, not love-based. Yes. If, if I don't agree with something, how come I can't tell you? If, you? if I think you're wrong and I love you, how come I can't tell you you're wrong? I think you're wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But wouldn't it be wise for me to find out I'm wrong today than to discover 20, I've been wrong about you for 20 years? But that's, that's what I think. That's what I believe. That's what I'm feeling. Okay, I'm wrong. I got, I got partial information. Maybe I got it from Uncle Bubba and he was wrong. But if we can't talk, if there's no space for confrontation, there's no room for growth. And the reason why we can't grow is we can't be real. Can't be honest. Can't be truthful. You show me where love is when there's a relationship where you can't be truthful. Are you with me here? 
Man, I don't like the way you talk to me. I'm like, you know, Deborah and I have had those conversations about things like, <clears throat> you know, I may be joking, but, you know, she don't particularly like that type of joking. You know, maybe I just went a little too far. And then she, she, you know, and I did it publicly, and she go, well, you know, I really don't appreciate that. Well, then, okay, thank you for telling me, because I'll go go a little further. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for giving a brother a heads up. Because <laughs> if I know it, I'm probably going to tell it. Well, not all, not, not everything, you know. I know, I know confidentiality and when it needs to be confidential. All right. Look what he says in the Amplified. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craving and clinging and fawning fear, but he has given us a spirit, look at this now, of power and of love. And of, watch this, calm, well-balanced mind. Underline that. Look at your neighbors. You need that. I know you need that. <laughs> calm, well-balanced mind. You, you know, you don't, you don't have things out. You don't have, you're not acting or reacting out of the wrong perspective on things. Well-balanced. Well-balanced. Calm, calm, calm down. Calm. Well-balanced. You don't fly off the handle with a, with, with a tenth of the information. You only got a tenth of the knowledge necessary to make an intelligent decision, but you, you go to the end of the conclusion. You draw a conclusion from a tenth. That's not well balanced. Are you with me here? You know, never, never draw a conclusion based on one side of any situation. This is for adult parents with, with children, adult children, adult married children. Don't listen to your son or daughter's side of what's going on wrong in the marriage. They both got a part. I'm just saying. Amen. So if you just hear one side, then you're, you're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be jacked up. Come I'm tell you what's going to happen. Here be the truth. They're going to make up. You're going to still be mad. And now they're going to come over all huggy-duggy, kissy-kissy, and you're going to be straight up ready to act like a... N That's going to be you. <laughs> Cause you can't believe after how he treated her, he gonna she gonna be in here just all smiling and you only got part of the story. You need well, you need a calm, well balanced mind. Amen. Amen. You know, if you upset, you don't hear well anyway. You ever been mad trying to make a decision? Yes, sir. It wasn't a good outcome, was it? You ever seen people fighting and trying to prove their point why they fight? That's a mess. You can't hardly, then they're not articulate. Especially when somebody's swinging at your head. <laughs> you can't talk good, you can't think well. Bad things happen because somebody's not calm. Look at this well balanced mind, discipline, and self control. So you need all of those things. Amen? Amen? Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 15. Okay, I got to stop. I got to hurry up and stop. Hebrews chapter 2. Glory be to God. Verse 15. Uh... Look at this, and deliver them who through fear of death, now not just physical death, death of relationship, death of finances, death of your physical, death of your physical body, it's death applied to any situation, who, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
So there are some people in bondage simply because of, of fear that they've had in their life and let exist in their life for their whole life. I mean, your, your mama, your grandmama, God bless her, may have instilled fear. It was like the grandmama that told you, you know, you, you got to have your personal staff. Don't always mix all your money with a man because they might leave you and you ain't going to have nothing. That's her fear. And that was the man she was choosing. Your chooser, because it's influenced by the Holy Spirit, is better. So don't let her fear dictate how you choose to do things. See, that's that generational fear transfer. It's a spirit, you understand? It ain't a curse on you, you're born again. But that spirit of fear can be transferred with words. Just somebody conveying to you. Okay, you got to watch out for them. Watch out for them high yellow people. Mm -hmm. They've been up there. They've been close to the massa. You know they don't like us dark-skinned folk. You better watch out for them. I mean, that's kind of stuff you hear people say. Oh, y'all, y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. So then, so then you on a job, and your boss happened to be of fair complexion. And now their words are now controlling your thoughts. I don't know about them. You see how simple, how, how, how easily influenced we are by the spirit of fear? I had one guy tell me one time, you know, God told him to join the church. He's a black guy. God, I mean, he was a really black guy. Black, black guy. But he said, no, I'm going to show you his fear. He said, he said, he said, I, I, I can never sit under a black pastor. I said, well, good thing I ain't been black since 62. <laughs> but I understood what he was saying. He had a fear of submitting to a pastor who was of color because he'd been hurt by a pastor of color. So in his mind, I just got to sit under a pastor of a different color. That's fear. Are you with me here? And all while he was here, he struggled. Because I wasn't changing color. <laughs> Are you listening to me? We have all kind of fears like that. My mother had a fear of turning left. So wherever she drove, she always had to make right turns. Y'all trying to figure that out, right? Don't hurt your brain. <laughs> My father told her, most accidents occur when you cross an intersection turning left. So to avoid having accidents, she always turned right. She would go miles out of the way to get around to making just right turn. Am I right, Deborah? Oh, she had a lot of fear. That's, that's, that's a simple one. She had a fear of color television. Yeah. You know, we were back when they had black and white TVs, and you put the little, the closest we got to a color TV was that red, yellow, and green little screen that you, you taped it on the front of your TV. That was it. I, I kid you not. She had a fear of microwave ovens. For years. Something wrong with food being cooked that fast. Giving you radiation. You're going to die of radiation. That's what she thought. She had a fear of flying. So every time she would come down here, Deacon Mildred used to go get my mama from Alabama to bring her down here every summer. One time, you know, she was riding a bus, but then there were some weird people on the bus, so she had a fear of buses. Then... You know, she was going to ride Amtrak one time. It crashed. That was done. <laughs> you got your own fears that you need to be delivered from. Things like fear of failure. You, 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 you get in a certain place and you get comfortable where you are and you don't want to change. You don't want to move. You don't want things to change. If anybody try to get you to change and you think they're against you. Fear. There are some people who have a fear of growth. You know, growth 
places a demand on you being more responsible for that growth. More responsible for that increase. Well, I don't know. You know, you've heard people say, I would never have a house that big. Look at that. Who's going to clean it? Probably the maid. <laughs> if you got a house that big, you probably got enough money to get somebody to clean it for you. Right? So that's an unfounded fear. Some of y'all have fears of things that will never happen. And even if it did, you probably got enough to cover it. One lady would never, wouldn't buy a house. She had a fear of owning a house. Why do you fear owning your own house? What if something break? No, it's true. True story. She had a fear of owning a house. She said, if something break, then I, I don't know if I'll have the money to fix it. So she would not buy a house. She, she was more comfortable living in an apartment than buying a house. And I'm like, but you know, the owner of that apartment, he's included in the mortgage the cost of repairing and maintaining the place you're living in. So you could buy your own place, put that same money to the side to cover those same expenses. Or you could buy insurance to cover it. I don't know if I want all that responsibility. Okay, that's fear. Are you listening to me? Yeah. You see? Did I read Hebrews? Revelation 21 and 8. Okay, I got it. I ain't going to read it now. <laughs> I commentated myself out of it. <laughs> Revelation 21 and 8. Very familiar passage of scripture, but maybe not in this light. Why is it you don't want to be influenced by the spirit of fear? It's, it's a demonic spirit. Amen? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power, love, and a sound mind. You shouldn't have any fear of anything. Look what the category that the Bible puts fear in. But the fearful. Verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's not good. Being fearful is being lumped in with all these other people with all these other issues. So it's not okay for you to walk around and be fearful. Listen to this in the Amplified. But as for the cowards, you know, you don't want to confront things need to be confronted. You don't want to talk to your wife, your daughter, your child about the truth. You don't want to talk to your coworker that keep getting you to do all their work. Well, I don't want to start no trouble. I'm going to start some trouble. I'm doing their work. I want some of their pay. I don't mind doing their work. If I'm doing their work, and my work, that means I got time to do my work and their work. There's not a problem. I just want their pay. Amen. Pay me for doing my part and their part. We ain't got no problem. Let's keep it rolling. <laughs> I'm not complaining about them not doing their job. Thank God they don't. I'm doing it. Pay me though. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Obviously, I'm an excellent employee. I could do my job and half of somebody else's. I don't want no raise. Just give me part of their pay. <laughs> Seem reasonable to me. Yeah. Cowards, ignorable, the contemptible, and the cravingly lacking in courage, and the cowardly submissive. You know, some people have this, this submissive appearance because they scatter everything. They're just scared. Fear of failure. They don't try because they think, well, what happens if I try? Well, my thought is, what happens if you don't try? Right. You know, if you don't get it right the first time, just start over. You know, business, things like that, not marriage. Look at it, say business, not marriage. Business, not marriage. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be careful what you say these days, folks. Like, I've been wanting a reason to get rid of it. I heard Pastor Post say <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hurt you in the spirit. Hurt you in the spirit. He said, for the unbelieving and faithless, the unbelieving and faithless, and 
as for the depraved and defiled with abominations and, and murderers, lewd, adulterous, practices, practicers of magic arts and the idolaters, those who uh, give supreme devotion to anyone or anything other than God. And all liars, those who knowingly convey untruth by word or deed, all of these shall have their part in the lake that burneth, uh, that blazes with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. You know, the first death, man, that's a bad deal, right? Second death, I mean, you already dead, man. How bad can it get? According to this, it can get worse. Well, that's all fear. It's all fear. So that's how far fear can take you. You know, fear doesn't end up where it starts. You give heed to fear. You start governing your life and your decisions based on fear, then it can end up as bad as it could possibly be. Because number one, you're not operating by the Spirit of God. They that are the sons of God are led by what? Spirit. Well, you can't have the Holy Spirit and the spirit of fear functioning and operating in the same person at the same time. You can't be influenced by the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, and the spirit of fear, which is orchestrated by Satan at the same time. It's going to be one or the other. Now, I didn't say possessed. I said influenced by. All right? You could be born again and influenced by the spirit of fear. How? What you see, what you hear, what you say, and what has filled your heart. Amen? Now, let me show you the out for this, the answer. Isaiah 54, 14. Okay, we heard all that part, now here's the other part. What do I do, pastor? What do I do? Here you go. Verse 14 says, Isaiah 54, 14 says, In righteousness shall thou be established, that thou, like this, thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear. It's not part of our covenant. Not part of the promises of God. Amen. Far from oppression and not fear. And from terror. We don't have to be afraid of terrorists. For it shall not come near thee. That's a covenant promise from God. Let me show you how it's demonstrated in Matthew chapter 4 and we'll stop right there. Am I going too fast? Get the tape. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say I have no fear. Have no fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear. So I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not, I'm not fearful of anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm a bad, bad boy. I'm a bad or a woman, you know. You know, in a positive sense, you know. I'm bad, man. I, mess, I make the devil wait, wish he wouldn't have woke up this morning. A demon's worst nightmare is to run into a man or woman with faith. He's not looking for you. The Bible says, I'm not making this up, the Bible says Satan as a roaring lion goes about seeking whom he may devour. Every now and then because he's stupid and he's dumb, he end up messing with one of us. That's more fight than he want. Because we're going to fight. And I only fight one fight. It's called a good fight of faith. Tell the fool, bring a lunch. Because we're going to fight till I win. There's one way. You engage me. There's one way this is going to end up. I win. Because God is on my side. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why I don't mind the fight. I don't mind the fight. It's not a rope of dope. No, it's, I'm going to whoop your tail till you get tired of being beat. Amen. Amen. See, that's, that's got to be your posture, your stance, your belief. He goes about seeking. All right, let's, let's use you for an example. If you walk up in the park. And you see a guy whooping every butt that walk in the park. And you just want to fight. I guarantee you ain't picking him. I'm talking about this guy knocking fools out like crazy. Bam! 
one slick, pow, they falling out. You want to fight. You're you going to fight somebody that's getting up. <laughs> yeah, I saw you fall. Let me see if you can fall again. Bam! No, you ain't messing with the dude that's knocking folks out, right? That's why Satan don't want to mess with you. He dealt with Jesus. He got dusted. The seven sons of Sceva discovered that. Yeah. Them demons said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? <laughs> What's your claim to fame? And the Bible says they jumped on those men, stripped them naked, and ran them out. Why? They sensed the fear in them. All he did was say, well, wait, wait, what you, what's your claim to fame? My claim to fame is the blood of Jesus. My claim to fame is the promises of the word of God that cannot fail. I win. Say it with me. I win. I win. Look at your neighbor say, I always win. I always win. You do know that, right? You, do know that, right? you know, some victories come because of, of your ability to outlast the devil. Oh, son, that's a sweet one there. That's when the folk that thought you were going to fail, they, they find out years later, you're not only better, you, you not only didn't fail, but you're better off. Amen. Then they come back and join you. So, okay, all right, I get it. That's Jesus. You got to know who you are. So, here in Matthew, I'm going to read through this and then we'll be done. Then was Jesus led of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Look at this. If the, if, if the devil tempted Jesus, he's going to tempt you. Or test you. If he was tested, you're going to be tested. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. So we see the direction of the test. It was in his physicality. His humanity. He didn't test him in his spirit. He tested him in his humanity. Are you with me here? He tested him in his, in his humanity. In his flesh. Listen to this. And when the tempter came to him, he said, look at the first test. It's an identity test. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He knew who he was. But he wanted to know if he knew who he was. Especially after his flesh was weak. After his humanity had been tempted. In other words, if someone flirting with you, it's an identity test. If, if someone hitting on you, it's an identity test. Will you succumb to the temptation? It's not in your spirit. It's on your flesh, which is the weakest part of you. Your response, your proper response is going to be based on your relationship with Christ, not on the strength of your flesh. The Bible said Jesus was hunger, hungry. So what did he tempt him with? Food. Are you listening? It's an identity test. But he answered, well, he says, commanded these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, as Jesus answered, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He said, you know, I, I'm, I'm stronger in my spirit with the word of God to resist the temptation of the demands on my humanity. Are oh, you with me here? Then he said, then the devil, he didn't leave him. Look at never said, one test don't mean he done with you. Like, okay, you, you passed that one. Let me see if you can pass this one. All right. He stepped up the game a little bit. He said, then the devil taking him, him up into the holy, holy city, setting him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. What is he doing there? He said, okay, so you're going to throw the word at me? The devil said, I know the word too. Let's see how well you know the word. He misquoted that scripture. This is a test of his knowledge. Okay, you said that, 
do you really know the word? You act like you know the word. Let's see how much word you really know. Or you just repeating what you heard some preacher say. Did you really study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing word of truth? Or you just acting like you know? You know, some people are no, some Christians are no better than parrots. A parrot can repeat, but a parrot has no understanding. You can say what you heard somebody said, but until you've lived it and experienced it, it's not truth to you. That's what he was saying. He could have he got real slick, you know, and just, just said, well, you know, all things are possible to them that believe and jumped off the building. Then Jesus would have tempted God, tempted the Father to do something, to prove something to a defeated foe. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, Lord, if this really you, then, then, then you know, that, if that really my husband, let him wear a red jacket to church. <laughs> Okay. That day, five guys show up with red jackets. <laughs> all right, let's finish. Are you with me here? So we all going to be tested, right? Jesus was tested. Is a servant greater than a master? If I've suffered persecution, so shall you. That's not the problem. How equipped are you to deal truthfully with the persecution? That's going to determine the outcome. Some people fold up like a $3 suit in a rainstorm at the, at the, at the, at the moment of, a of any kind of trouble. Most of y'all trouble just had to do with money anyway. And not even a whole lot of money. You ain't lost $10 million. But you act like you did. Are you with me here? Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, come on now. Our God is an awesome God. You falling under the pressure of very small, manageable challenges Amen. that are temporary at that. Some of y'all, some of y'all had trouble last year. You don't even remember. So that show you how, how really it wasn't quite that bad. You had trouble ten years ago. You don't, you don't even remember. You can't even think of. You can't even figure it out. But 10 years ago, you thought it was the end of your world. And here you are 10 years later. Are you listening to me? I got a, I got a bump it attitude with a lot of stuff. Bump that. The devil suggests bump that, bump you, bump your mama. She ugly anyway. Jesus said unto him, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil, he ain't done with him yet. Again, the devil taking him up. Oh, Pastor, how come all these things keep happening to me? I mean, I get out of one challenge and then here comes another challenge. Well, you any greater than Jesus? You ought to be prepared to handle these things victoriously. Say, I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. Not an underachiever. I can do, I can do all, things all things through Christ, through Christ. The, anointed the anointed one, and his anointing, and his anointing. that strengthens me. Man, I'm anointed. Hallelujah. Say that, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. Yeah. Hallelujah. The anointing removes burdens and destroys yokes. I'm built for the fight. Yes. I like the fight. Mm -hmm. Spiritual fights. Amen. Let you know where you are. It's a sad thing to think you're ready to go 12 rounds with Mike Tyson. Well, spiritually speaking. A 12-round fight where really you can only go two. But you think you can go 12. No, you need some more training. He says... Again, the devil taking them up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. 
and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, in the book of Luke, it says it left him for a season. You know, one of the things that you can mistakenly think is that when the, when the devil leave off tempting and challenging you, that he's done with you. No, he's done for a season. If you win, he sees how prepared you are in that season. He waits for what he thinks is a better season when you may not be prepared. Life as a Christian is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You can't see your life in, in, in low 100 yard dashes. You got to see it in 30 mile runs. Amen. You got to pace yourself through your walk with Christ and overcoming the challenges to that walk. Amen? Amen. That's, that's, that's the life we live. There are things that you experience in your first year with Christ that are very, very challenging and he overcomes things for you. You experience those same things in your 20th year in your walk with Christ. Now it's time for you to overcome. You notice the last thing he tempted him with was money, fame, power. The last thing he tempted him with was position, status, acceptance of men. But one thing I want you to see in this, he didn't offer him any more than what he already had. Everything he offered him, he already had. Satan is the ultimate con man. A good con man never offers you any more. Well, he offers you the least he has to, to take what he wants from you which is everything. So everything he offered him was the least because it was on the earth. It was the best that was on the earth, but it was the least because it was on the earth. Jesus, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, ruling the universe. There was no way he was going to sacrifice rulership in the universe for rulership on the earth. You know, the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. When we succumb to pressure and temptation because of any fear, fear of loss, fear of failure, fear of loss of opportunity, this is the last time I get this opportunity. Listen, if God is in control, it's not the last chance for anything. Don't let fear dictate your actions. Amen? You get anything out of the word today? Yeah. That an iPad mini? What is that? That's like a Kindle Fire. A That's a Samsung. That's the enemy. <laughs> what is that? Samsung. That's a Samsung. Oh, y'all got Samsungs. <laughs> oh, man. Stand to your feet. Let's pray and be dismissed. You get anything out of the word today? Yeah. Now. Friday night, Tuesday night, what, what night? What night is the thing? Tuesday night, 9 o'clock. We're going to talk about how to start. Amen? How to start. How to start. How to start. We're going to overcome that fear of starting something new, something better, something greater. Amen? Father, we thank you today for your presence. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you said your word would not return vain, void, and unproductive. But, Father, you said it would accomplish everything that you sent it forth to accomplish. And we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for what your word is doing to transform us into the image of your dear son. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings that our obedience will produce in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, it's not my job to try to persuade you or convince you of something you don't want to do, but just to offer you an opportunity to receive our Savior as your Lord, if you want to. You know, there's no greater reward that you can receive in the earth than Jesus as your Savior. Over 31 years ago, I was an alcoholic and my life was a wreck and someone introduced me to Jesus. 
And you know what's interesting about that time in my life? I knew I wanted a different life. I knew I wanted things to change. I knew there had to be a better way to live than the way I was living. I'll never forget when the opportunity was offered to me to accept Jesus as my Savior. And then to study the Word of God and get to know who He really was. Not in a religious sense, but in a relational sense. I remember Pastor Dollar saying that if you will commit yourself to studying the Word of God for 90 days, it'll change your life forever. You'll never be the same. That was over 31 years ago. And my life has changed. And millions of other people's lives have changed. So the question is, do you want a different life? It starts with a right relationship with Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, I don't have that relationship, but I want to know. I want, I want Jesus as my Savior. I don't, I don't want to just come to church and act like I know what's going on. No, I really want to change now. I'm ready for change. Well, the first step in that process is accepting Jesus as your Savior. If that's you, I don't want to do it under the cover because you can't live this life under the cover. We do it openly. You do it boldly. You do it not like a coward. You do it confidently. You say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I want a different life. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand and we'll pray with you today. Thank you, brother. God bless you, man. You may put your hand down. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. I see your hand. God bless you. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. It's not, it's not a decision we make out of our emotions. It's a decision we make because we want different. We want change. Secondly, you say, Pastor, I've heard you guys speaking in tongues. I don't know what that is. Sounds strange to me. I, I want to know. It sounds like you're speaking another language where we are. It's called the, 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 the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence speaking in other tongues. Now, it's a gift that you receive from the Holy Spirit. Spiritual prayer language. What is the benefit to you? When you pray in unknown tongues, you pray under the unction of the Holy Spirit. We'll explain all that to you. It's in the Bible. So we don't teach you how we show you how to receive. It's a big difference. It is a real gift from the Holy Spirit. So if you'd like to receive that gift, I want you to raise your hand. You say, Pastor, I'd like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or I'd like to get understanding. Thank you. I see your hands. God bless you. you may put your hands down. Last and most certainly not least, you're here. You say, Pastor, I believe the Lord has spoken to my heart to join this church. You know, I believe it's important that you be in the right place to hear the right thing. You know, it's as simple as this. If God called you to rebuild transmission, but you're in a church where they only talk about rebuilding engines, you'll never be equipped to do what the Lord has called you to do. So it's important that you're in the right place hearing the right thing. Amen? So if God has laid it on your heart, that's not something I decide for you, not something someone else decides for you. You have to hear from God, and then he'll speak to your heart. You say, well, how, how do I know it's God? Okay, when you got ready to come to church this morning, there's a whole lot of churches. You pass by some on your way here. How'd you know to come here? Well, I just felt like it. Well, that's the Lord telling you where to go. I can guarantee it wasn't the devil. He ain't that big a fool. So sometimes we try to figure things out that God has already worked out. You say, well, okay, every time I get ready to come to church, this is where God sends me. Well, if he wanted you somewhere else, he'd have sent you somewhere else. God's not double-minded. Amen. So, three things. Salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, join the church. If God has spoken in your heart, to act out on one of those requests and I want you to come and join me at the altar get your personal belongings come, come this way everyone else turn to your left, your right ask the person next to you the same question if they say yes I want to get saved yes I want to rededicate my life then why don't you join hands and come up with them hallelujah glory to God Alex stand with this brother until somebody else comes 